every aspect of our physiology. In fact, the idea is we weren't separate from the plants. It was a symbiotic relationship. So when we talk about ourselves as individuals, we've, we've already started at the wrong place. There's no way I can make a claim like this if there's not a mountain of data. And in our modern view of ourselves, I mean, our ancestors felt there was a problem. They, they developed practices, techniques to change perception. And I'm going to suggest these were nothing more than treatments for a neurodegenerative condition. That's how I'd say it today. It might see it. Um, this is a kind of image, the, the, the sort of allusion to the state of mind we once all shared. In fact, the idea there were separate people is perhaps part of this condition. You all heard the term, sort of, we're all one, all the same, we bandy it around. I suspect there was a reality to that beyond our current perception. And, of course, um, it opens the door to an endless array of concepts of reality and identity. We have names. We're a human being, we're a, uh, a being of light, we have nationalities. Hundreds, if not thousands, of identity beliefs. Many of them contradictory, many of them utterly contradictory. And yet the ancient traditions talk about a single sense of self. And interestingly, coming out again out of some of the studies, one side of a brain, when you access it, and the deeper you access it, you begin to struggle to find words. But the words, regardless of the tradition, regardless of history, regardless of culture, they always talk the same kind of way. Astounding, profound, divine. So I'm, I'm just saying these are clues. Eventually they should form a picture, I hope. As I, as I explained, I have drawn on Darwinian evolution. I'm not saying it's the best approach, but it's, it's a very major paradigm in modern science, and I'm interested in engaging with the academics. What I found interesting, um, I've got a background in plant sciences, and what I found interesting is the most complex ecosystems we know, the most complex molecular ecology we know, seems to produce very large brains as if they grow on trees. Looking at our origins, and you can go as esoteric as you like really, um, but sort of starting with the more atomic world that we, we sort of hear an awful lot about, sort of post Big Bang or beyond the quantum divide or whatever, what you see is increasing complexity, phenomenal complexity. The most complex ecosystems that have emerged from biological evolution Tropical forests, not only that, the tropical forests co-evolutionary relationship with primates where our physiology has changed radically and we specialize in leading yep, the sex organs in developmental environments. That's utterly unique. So this is a, a sort of simplified diagram just showing the basic evolutionary mechanisms. I um, won't go into too much detail, it's probably a bit too tedious in some ways. Um, but it just shows that the human developmental environment, classic mammalian developmental environment, and the hormone regime is managed by our neural system. Of course, that feeds into the developmental environment and affects the development of the next generation neural system and how it manages the endocrine system, the hormone system. It all works really well. But what we did through our relationship with plants, well, when I say our relationship with plants, I think I, I kind of see them more as um, drug dealers, really. They were standing on the corners of the forest, you know, waving their sex organs, which were full of drugs, and they were all highly colored, and we, we were sort of taken for a ride, really. You know, it's uh, quite a ride, I think. You start adding in the developmental environments of not one species, maybe 20, maybe 50, maybe 200. All distinct, all full of hormones. That's flooding our own developmental environment, reading the DNA differently, both real time and particularly dur during our early development. And it's interesting with plant hormones, not only will they read mammalian DNA, they'll build different kinds of structure, but they will read it. And there's good literature on this. They also inhibit, damp down the activity of their own steroids like estrogen, of estrogens, like testosterone. They're, they're not exclusively male or female, as I'm sure you know, but there is a gender issue, which I'll talk about in a bit if I've got time. That's what plant hormones do. 
and that's what we formed a relationship with. So the idea that our endocrine system was standalone anymore, it's, it's, it's a non-starter. And again, the co-evolutionary relationship's well, well evidenced, it's well written about. Nobody's contradicting the data, it's just putting all the bits in the same place. Our age of sexual maturity is, is dropping quite markedly in recent times, and these are the hormones that move it in the other direction changes the speed of sexual maturation but that gives the neural system more time to develop and we're losing that window almost as we speak yeah and it's uh, I know this is stuff you're all familiar with but we, we've gone again from some of the most complex pristine biochemistry hormonally rich and of course plants are delivering complex biochemistry to build a whole new plant that's what the seeds are that's why they're nutritionally dense so that's all been delivered to the one place that's what we were eating now again, I'm, I'm, this is really just saying all, all the modern data is saying our neural system is one of the most complex things we know, the most complex thing in the known universe. It's incredibly sensitive to chemical change, let alone congenital change. Very sensitive, and it's massively changed. Any idea that it's going to be the same as it was 200,000 years ago, it's a non-starter. Of course, it's, you know, is there any evidence? Is there a problem with our neural system? Has it degenerated? Are we showing traits of mental ill health? It's like humans have looked at, you know, we, we look at our own origins. We seem to be the only species doing that. And yet we're perplexed at our own origins, which is kind of odd. But once you factor in this, it's like, well, you just need to look at how the DNA is read by the developmental environments of the most complex species we know. And that's enough to go from is not necessarily quite accurate in species and so on, but the, 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 modern, the modern science seems to suggest our origins were insect eating. So you go from eating insects um, to eating, again, the most complex stuff we know. Totally changed our physiology, totally changed our development, and eventually, in time, as these loops start feeding into each other, it seems to always produce very complex and relatively large neural systems. It's all orthodox data, and it's echoed in the Arcadian tradition, so there's no real contradiction, except for the bit where we forget to account for the thing looking at the data. So, flowering plants um, are incredibly biochemically complex, that's why the pharmacology, uh, pharmacology companies go over there, they're always looking for cool novel molecules, and a single plant cell produces more novel chemicals than probably the whole pharmaceutical industry put together. You know, most of it's unrecorded, most of it's unknown. They, their, their DNA is more complex and their chemistry is more complex. They're pumping thousands of chemicals all the time that we don't know what they do or what they're for. And then that's all concentrated in the developmental environment to build a whole new plant. So it's all got to be in there, plus the addition of a whole bunch of hormones to reconfigure the way the DNA is read to build a whole new plant. So it's, it is incredibly complex. I mean, whether there's whether you can find some exceptions to that, it's kind of missing the point. The context is it's incredibly complex um, and very hormonally rich. Um, yeah, the same class of chemicals that are rich in fruit, uh, not only the hormonally active, chemically generally very rich, very high in antioxidants, which is great if you've got a big neural system made of fatty acids because it's very susceptible to oxidization. They're also neuroactive. A lot of the chemicals in fruit, mildly so, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, whole classes of them. Um, and that's interesting in many areas, but particularly in regard to the pineal gland, which is, crops up a lot in ancient tradition, people are interested in for all sorts of reasons. Eating a lot of fruit elevates the activity of your pineal gland, and the pineal gland, interestingly enough, pumps a bunch of chemicals, melatonin, pinoline, and other stuff, that kind of echoes the effects of fruit. It's like a fast-track feedback mechanism going on. So you're eating fruit, it's pumping the pineal gland a bit harder, it's pumping chemicals right into the neural system that inhibit the effect of steroids, that are powerful antioxidants that are mildly neuroactive. So there's all these loops within loops, all built around the symbiotic relationship with plants eating fruit. Then you take it away, the pineal gland's not working so hard changes the developmental environment, builds a different neural system that can't run the pineal gland so hard, and you end up from accelerating expansion, it stalls, and again, that, all the evidence suggests that's roughly 200 to 250,000 years ago, 
correlates well with the big drive. The system, because it's not genetically locked in, begins to stall and goes into a negative feedback loop. I don't know how many of you have come across this. Um, it's, it's hinted at in the ancient traditions, a sort of center of chi energy, all kinds of stuff related to developing a, a different shaped gut, or if you access altered states, your gut shape, you can feel it, it can change. Gut feelings, very sensitive. Um, this guy in the 70s, I think, did an awful lot of research, um, specialized in, in human digestion, and he proposed that actually the human gut is a tube of neural tissue, it's a, it's a brain very complex. He was derided for a while, but as the data emerged and the neurochemistry tests were done, it's like, oh my god, we really do have a second brain here. Of course, it's not really a second brain, it's all connected, it's all part of the same neural system. So basically our gut is muscular, but it also has a tube of highly complex neural tissue, which makes it all the more scary when you realize what people put in it, what I used to put in it when I was younger. So, oh my god, pouring that stuff straight into your neural system. And it also makes sense when you look at the complexity of fruit, why our gut is so complex. It was like pouring neurochemistry straight into a neural system. Amazing. Okay, um, I'd normally take a break and then we go into the next section, but that's for a couple of days' time. So there'll be more detail on um, the neural system and delusion in particular and why it's been difficult to spot this. Um, and including some of the correspondence I've had with some of the most eminent modern science thinkers and so on. So that's it for now. Um, if there's any...